thank you so much, Connie, for hosting as well. Thank you so much, uh, Jake, and our awesome worship ministry for leading us in worship. Thank you, Asna, for praying. Thank you, Marita, for praying. Thank you, everyone, for just having a vibe. I mean, there's a real vibe here. Vanessa, who's currently teaching the Lions, I think, or the Cubs, uh, she was in Australia for a few weeks, and she came back this morning. She's like, "Woo, there's a vibe. And I said, yes, yes, indeed. Uh, just in case you don't know who I am, it's definitely not my first time at Fellowship City. My name is Reino, and I have the privilege of serving this church as pastor. I have the privilege of opening up God's Word with you this morning. And for what it's worth, I do like Mars Boota. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> I, grew, uh, I, mean, I grew up in his heydays. It was amazing. That was back in the late 1900s for all y'all that's really, really young. Let me pray for us. Father God, thank you so much um, that we can know you. Thank you for being our Father. Thank you that we can look to you. Thank you that you lavish us with your love and grace. Thank you that you have given us the opportunity to be reconciled to you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that we can experience joy and intimacy with you and with our brothers and sisters as we gather here on a Sunday. Thank you that we can do this freely in South Africa. That we don't have to lock doors, that I, that I don't have to speak in a whispering voice, that we're not threatened in any way. Thank you for the privilege of that. And thank you that we can learn together. So Father God, you uh, have all wisdom, and we seek to receive it and to learn it. And therefore, I ask now that you speak through your word as we open it up this morning. May our time together glorify you, may it inspire us. May we be transformed in your image, Lord Jesus, our ultimate, awesome, and gracious friend. We pray that in your name. Amen. Amen. So we're busy with the series. The series is called God's World, God's Way. Think about it, fam. The world we live in is God's world. So if you live in God's world and you live God's way, then you are wise. Or it is wisdom to live God's way in God's world. Listen, not only knowing, but actually doing. Not only hearing, but actually applying. That's wisdom. Why? Because it is all His, you know. And He has a will for it. His world, His way. Wisdom is doing it and applying it. Now, to help us receive or gain wisdom, we are currently studying a book. And that book is known as Wisdom Literature. And that book's name is Proverbs. It is a book that is designed to teach us wisdom. Look at this summary of the book with me. I know it's small. just want you to see the big blocks. It's divided like this. A long introduction of nine chapters, then a colossal middle section, chapters 10 to 29, and then a last word from two characters called Agur and Lemuel, right? That's the book of Proverbs. Look at the bottom here. It says, Proverbs does not equal good advice. Proverbs equals God's invitation to live, and now I can't even read the rest because I'm too close to it. To learn, God's invitation to learn wisdom for, from previous generations. That's what it says. We are going to replace the lamp possibly next week. Okay, you guys can chill. The week after it will be HD. Okay. So it's not good advice. It's actually God's invitation to learn from previous generations. The book's really practical. It speaks of a lot of things that we face. Look at this word cloud in the middle. Marriage, debt, justice, speech, character, family, work, generosity, alcohol, forgiveness, etc. That's what the book of Proverbs is all about. Really, really practical. And then we have a little summary on this map. We're just going to zoom in there, top right. Read it with me. Biblical wisdom literature, which includes Proverbs, is exploring how to live well in God's world. Wisdom is not law. It doesn't say thou shall or thou shalt not. Wisdom is also not prophecy. It's not thus says the Lord. Wisdom is the accumulated insight of God's people through generations. That's biblical wisdom. 
Are you guys with me? So someone lived before us, and then someone spoke about what they learned. And we are wise if we learn from those who spoke and those who wrote. Okay. Last week, Lesejo kicked off the series. He spoke about the background of Proverbs. He spoke about Proverbs pointing to Jesus. He spoke about the expressions of wisdom. What does wisdom look like and how do we actually express it? And he spoke about Jesus as the epitome of wisdom. Great sermon. Please catch up on it. YouTube channel and your favorite podcast platform. Today, we are going to talk about friendship. There you go. Our theme for today. Now, fam, friendship runs deep. We just heard a little bit of it during our question of the day. But just think about it. Think about movies. Think about television programs. Friendship permeates all of them. And not only does friendship permeate them, a lot of times the story actually goes or is about friendship. Like I said, back in the late 1900s, the most popular show between 1990 and 2000 was actually called Friends, right? Marie and I watched the show back in the day. I can't even remember the year. It was called Lost. Crazy. People, plane, an island that keeps on moving. But in the end, six seasons, after six seasons, you realize, oh, the whole story is actually about friendship. Some people being dead and then not being dead anymore, but then you're back in time, but then you're forward in time, and then they're not dead, but they were dead, but now they're getting dead again. It was a whole vibe. But it was about friendship. The movie Castaway. Dude spends some time alone, and he makes Wilson a friend out of a volleyball. We chuckle at it, <laughs> but the movie is about the fact that he needs companionship, and that he's going to go crazy if he's alone. Think about The Lord of the Rings. And The Hobbit, epic movies, massive plotline characters and different spaces and spheres of Middle-earth. It's really about friendship, isn't it? Samwise Gamgee and Frodo Buggins. What a phenomenal friendship. What a great story. Think about songs. I was listing some songs as I was prepping my sermon. But then I realized if you are in a transcultural church, that is dangerous to go to songs. Because some people might go, whoop, whoop. And other people might go, I hate that song. So that's not where we are. But just think about songs. How many songs do you know that speaks about friendship? Many. And uh, the ups and downs of friendship, you know. Some of them appreciate friendship and some of them say, I'm done with friendship and I don't need friends. But friendship is all in there. Let's talk about social media and the internet. What's the whole purpose of that vibe? Is connection and friendship. It's not working at the moment. But that is the purpose of that platform. Can I friend you? Will you accept my friend request? Unfortunately, the world we live in, oh, people feel so hurt. You haven't accepted my friend request. Oh, I was unfriended by that person. <laughs> so it's not working well, but it, it is about friendship, right? And it is about connection. Think about stories of victory, someone doing something epic. They'll tell you, I had someone beside me. Friendship pulled me through. Think about stories of tragedy. We always hear that people were alone and isolated and they didn't have friends. Every time I see a Hollywood celebrity taking their own life, I wonder how is it possible? You've got 50 million people supposedly cheering you on, but you're so alone and in such a dark place that you end it all. Isn't it sad, the world we live in? We often hear those stories. What happened to you during question of the day? Just speaking about this very topic did something in you, which means that it matters. Now, Proverbs has a lot to say about friendship, and I'm going to read a wide selection of Proverbs today as our teaching text. Okay? Now, they are short, and they are really, really cool, and not that difficult to understand. Every time we read a proverb, it might feel to you like a five rand. I mean, a five rand is still money, B but it's not a lot. But fam, can I remind you that 200,000 five rands still make a million bucks, you know? So you'll see the value of the Proverbs about friendship when we start gathering them all together and when we work through them. Are you guys with me? Why does this matter? Do you remember the second part of the great commandment? You will love the Lord your God with everything inside of you. And then, you will love your neighbor as yourself. 
Friendship is no small thing. Jesus' whole ministry could actually be understood as friendship. Think about it. Jesus with people and Jesus through people. Jesus was even called a friend of sinners. We're going to get there a little bit later. Jesus wasn't called a lecturer of sinners. He wasn't called a coach of sinners. He was called a friend of sinners. Jesus sat around a table with people. And he was their friend. He was crucified because of who he ate with, amongst other things. Just let that sink in. Friendship is powerful, it's significant. The New Testament church was full of friendships. And so is our church also full of friendships. Think of the Apostle Paul. Paul always lists his friends at the end of his letters. We spoke about the list that he wrote in Colossians recently when I spoke about Epaphras. Here's the Apostle John. The very last words that John ever wrote. This is now the third epistle of the Apostle John. A little tongue twister there. The very last verse. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends. Each by name. Isn't that great? My friends, says Eta to your friends. Tell your friends to say Eta to my friends. Because we one massive group of friends. Why? Because we were created in God's image. We were created for relationship. God gave us himself and then he gave us each other. And the way that we relate to each other is through friendship. It's powerful. It's significant. Look at what Tim Keller says. If this world was made by a triune God, a being of community, then relationships of love are what life is really all about. So what is life all about? Well, in this context, it's all about relationships of love. That's the top priority. Do you know what our problem is? We have shallow and superficial friends. That's our problem. We've got social media friends. Some of us many. Influencers. Hashtag. Our problem is we've got high and by friends. Hi. Bye. We need deeper friendships than that. Now, thank God for Proverbs, because in His infinite wisdom, He wisely gave us Proverbs, and He gave us Proverbs about friendship, and how to have them in a really deep way. I believe this is a really timely word. This is just what we need. And these Proverbs count for friends, really close ones, and neighbors, right? Maybe a little bit further from you. These Proverbs count for people on all of those levels. Interesting, the word friend... In the Hebrew language, which is the language in which the Old Testament was written, which is the language in which Proverbs was written, the word for neighbor and friend is exactly the same word. It's one and the same thing. It's really just the context which helps us to be able to translate it into either friend or to neighbor. Here's what Proverbs teaches us. Three things today. One, the value of friendships. Two, the qualities of a good friend. Three, the qualities of a good neighbor. That's our map for today. Will you guys follow along? I forgot to put slides in that lists the first one, and then when I'm done with the first one, the second one, and when I'm done with the second one, the first and the second, and then the third one. Sorry, my bad. But there you go. That's where we're at. Let's look at the value of friendships. Why do you need friends? Let's start here. Proverbs 17:17. 17, 17. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Why do you need friends? Because you need to be loved. Whether you want to acknowledge it or not. That's why you need friends. Now there's an interesting distinction here between a brother and a friend. And here's the distinction. Your brother, i.e. your family, has to help you in a time of adversity. That's what family is there for. You didn't choose them. They didn't choose you. You stuck with them for the rest of your lives. So start loving them. That's how it is. But a friend chose you. Think about that. So your family is supposed to be there anyway. A friend chose to be there. Why? Because of love. And then it says, at all times this friend loves. There's a constant and a consistent love from your friends. It's just true. If you have healthy friendships and you have a healthy relationship with your family, you know how they differ. 
Like you know how they are distinct from one another. And that's what this verse says. Now, if we talk about love, we don't talk about warm fuzzies, you know. We talk about a choice to be other-centered. Here's how Paul describes love in 1 Corinthians 13. I don't have it on the slide, but just listen to it. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. So if Proverbs says a friend loves at all times, this is the kind of love it's talking about. Patience, kindness, no envy, never boasting, definitely not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. A friend that loves is a friend that works for and rejoices in your achievements. A friend that loves is a friend that has a desire for you and for your well-being and for your flourishing. A friend who's worthy of a friend being called a friend that loves is a friend that says, I'm so glad for you. That's awesome. I praise God with you for that. Not, eh, that's so unfair. I wish I got to do it. What? It's called envy. That's called being resentful and boastful. It's not how we roll, fam. Not if you're a Christian and not if you want to have friendships God's way. You have a desire for the other person. Look at Proverbs 18.24. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. So in this sense, companion is the word that's used to translate friend. So there's a difference between acquaintances and friends, or a companion. Now look at what it says. If you have many companions, if you have many friends, it may go really tough with you, but there will be the person that will stick even closer than a brother. We need this, fam. Do you know what they do with guys in prison when they act out? They put them in solitary confinement, all alone, 24 hours of the day. Do you guys know why? Because it's as close as you can, it, it's as close as you can get to hell in this life, is to be completely isolated and alone. That's why Tom Hanks made Wilson, the volleyball, you know, in the movie Castaway. Because being alone is dreadful. We desire as a church family for you to have these friendships and to make these friendships and to make these friends and companions here in this church. That's why our morning on a Sunday at least is designed for you to look each other in the eye. And our discipleship spaces are designed for you to look each other in the eye just a little bit longer because it's not a worship service. We want people to know each other here on a deeper level than just, hi. Do you see me with a stroller? I haven't pushed the stroller in quite some time. I don't know why I just thought of that. But point B, we have to move past, hi. Hi. We need to go deeper. Do you know how that happens? That happens through commonality, finding something we have in common, and it happens through transparency. Now, the moment I say something in common, I think we go, ooh, line of work, sports teams, life phase, place where you grew up, mother tongue. No, fam, here's the cool thing. If you are a Christian, you already have that in common with someone else. <laughs> How cool is that? I believe in Jesus, you believe in Jesus, that's a great start. So let's talk about this thing that we have in common. And that is that we believe in Jesus. If you are here this morning and you're not a Christian, I want you to know that the only difference between you and the people here who are Christians is they have found what you're still looking for. So you actually have that in common too, you know. So just say, I'm looking for something. And then they'll tell you, ooh, I found it. Let me tell you about it. And then you have that in common anyway. Commonality.
Look at what C.S. Lewis says about friendship. He says, friendship is born at that moment when one person says to another, What? You too? I thought I was the only one. Through that, through that, you know it. That's how friendship start. And you need to be in each other's space for that to be ignited. Look at what Tim Keller says. We'll move to transparency now. Tim Keller says, real friends always let you in and never let you down. Hectic. That's almost as good as a proverb one can say about Tim Keller. Real friends always let you in and never let you down. You make friends and you make companions, not only through commonality, but also through transparency, fam. And transparency means vulnerability. Love is rooted in vulnerability. And here's the best news that I can give you at this point, and that is that the cross frees us to be transparent. Do you guys realize that? At the foot of the cross, all of us have the same judgment. Sinner, separated from God, destined for eternity, away from Him. And we all have the same good news. And that is, you don't have to pay. Jesus paid it all. As a substitute, He suffered for you so that you can be saved. And there's no difference. So at the foot of the cross, we are all 100% the same. So why pretend? Think about it. The truth is out there anyway. Rainer Meyer is a wretched, black-hearted sinner. Saved by grace, through faith, through Jesus Christ, and he's on a journey of growth. Period. That's all I, in the words of Tom Hanks again, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> that's why we can be transparent. That's why we can be open with one another. So vulnerability, transparency. Why? So that we can get close to each other. Why? So that we can sharpen each other. Look at uh, Proverbs 27, 17. Iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. Do you guys know what that means? That means your friends impact who you become. The biggest lie in this world, well, one of the biggest, there are many lies. One of the biggest lies of this world is, I am who I choose to be. That simply is not the truth. You will become who you hang out with. Because there's a shaping and a transforming happening. You become who you hang out with. Think about it. First, you hang out with your family, because it's not like you can choose your friends. So they shape you in a profound way. They make you who you are. And then as you journey towards adulthood, you choose who you hang out with and you will become like them. It matters who we hang out with because there's a shaping and a sharpening. And this shaping and sharpening happens when there's vulnerability and transparency and your friends can address you honestly and lovingly and tell you, how you ought to be shaped. Do you see that? When I got saved, I remember it vividly, that Monday at campus, I got saved on a Thursday, went to church for the first time on the Sunday, and then on the Monday I went to campus and I sat with my friends. And I remember looking at them going, I'm going to have to find new friends. <laughs> it's not because there was something wrong with them, I just realized if I keep on going to nightclubs, dancing to sandstorm, and smelling like stivist the next day, I'm not really going to change now, am I? I'm going to remain that way, because that's how I was. I don't know if you guys, I don't know if English folk always called it stivist. In Afrikaans, we called it pit stif. <laughs> but that's how you smelt the next morning, you know, like an ashtray. So I looked at that going, hmm... I need something new. I need to be with people that can shape me in a different way. That is, amongst other things, the value of friendships. Do you guys see why we need it? Let's move on to the qualities of a good friend. Let's talk about consistency for a bit. 
Back to Proverbs 17, 17. Are you guys able to read? Are you able to read this? Yeah, it's small, but I'm just putting it all up there for you. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. We spoke about high and by friends. They are also known as fair weather friends. Friends are, are around when you do amazing stuff, and friends who disappear when things are going really, really rough. In the Hebrew, if you read this verse in Proverbs, at all times is in the beginning of the sentence. So literally it reads, at all times a friend loves. And that is to emphasize the consistency of friendship love. Jonathan and David, a really good example. In 1 Samuel 18, it says, Jonathan loved David as his own soul. Oh, my soul! Do you guys know how deep that is? I was just punning, and you didn't even laugh. <laughs> That's deep. That's really deep. In 1 Samuel 23, it says, Jonathan strengthened David's hands in God. That means Jonathan looked at David and he reminded David of the promises of God. Jonathan was always there in the good and in the bad. That is how we ought to roll as friends who are Christians who want to live according to God's wisdom. Is that you? Because if it is, that's wisdom. If it's not, it's foolishness. And you're damaging your friendships by being inconsistent. Fam, it's really difficult to be friends with someone who blows hot and cold. It's really difficult to be friends with someone who is here one day and there the next. It's really difficult to be friends with someone if you are never sure exactly where we are standing at the moment. That's inconsistency that leads to it. It's not wisdom. Think of Jesus himself. He had 12 and he had three, and he had John. I mean, just before he dies, looks at the apostle John and goes, dude, please take care of my mom. He had really, really deep, consistent friendships. And then, after his resurrection, what does he say? I will be with you always, right to the end of the age. It's part of Jesus' character. Hebrews 13 says, he'll never leave you nor forsake you. Consistency. It's the first quality of a good friend. Let's look at the second one. Openness or honesty. Look at Proverbs 27, 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of the enemy. Do you know what that means? Some people might give you kisses, but they're not your friends. They're flattering you. That's a word, isn't it? Oh, because we love likes. Oh, we love comments. Oh, we love it when the crowd tells us how awesome and cool we are. They are not your friends. They're just flattering you. Period. You know that Judas also kissed Jesus, right? Just putting that one out there. You need someone speaking to you honestly. You need someone who has the wisdom to choose their words when it's apt and fitting and relevant to correct you if you are wrong. That's what faithful are the wounds of a friend means. I see a lot of impatience recently. I need to talk to you about it because you're hurting people. Now that is a friend. I don't hear a lot of gratitude out of your mouth. You keep on complaining while you have more than enough. That's not consistent with your testimony. I hear you dissing your wife in conversations. You lied the other day and you need to repent of it. That's a good friend. I'm not talking about a friend that says, yeah, that jersey of yours is devastating. It makes me think of a Christmas tree. It sucks. <laughs> Don't ever wear it. I get nauseous when I look at it. That's not what I'm talking about. Sometimes it might get personal, like, 
Dude, your breath is a joy this morning. <laughs> Maybe just get a mint in there. That's a friend. That's a friend. I have a friend who always says, if I have a, if I have a booger in my nose, please tell me, hey dude, you've got a booger in your nose. Just do it. Instead of going, hey guys, have you all seen the booger in his nose? And then he carries on and knows nothing about it. That bad boy sitting there. Just be honest. Just be open. That's a good friend. That's a good friend. Why do we need this? Fam, we need this because sin is very deceptive. Let me give it to you straight. You think you are a lot better than you actually are. And that's why we need friends. I don't know when was the last time you did this. But you know, if you look at your reflection in a car's door, you are in much better shape than you actually really are. It's unbelievable. I mean, I'm a lean runner. But fam, when, when I look in the reflection of the car door, my calves, my calves look like shiamis. It's unbelievable. And I mean, these pencil arms of mine look like siam tanda kolisi. And I go, yes, Boiki is in, Boiki's in good shape, but I'm not. It's a deception. It's a lie. That's what sin does to us. Sin makes us believe that we're doing much better than we actually are. I mean, I'm a good person. If you don't ever say those words, I know that you think it. We should be transparent enough to give this honesty to friends, and we should be transparent enough to receive this honesty. Do you speak this way to your friends, and do you have friends that can speak that way to you? Another quality of good friends is counsel. Look at this amazing verse, Proverbs 27, 9. Oil and perfume make the heart glad, and the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. Let's talk about oil and perfume for a bit. Fam, if I walk into the house and Marie's busy getting ready, there's a pleasant aroma in the house, right? So I smell first the shampoo and then the, con then the conditioner, and it just gets more in the room as she blow dries her hair. Oh, and then the perfume, the favorite perfume. I'm expectant when I smell it. Do you know what I mean? Like it does something to me. If that's not your vibe, braai. Oh, there's nothing like it. You're just casually going about your business and you go, oh, woof. Something happens inside of you. For the vegetarians in the house, oh, that mushroom, <laughs> that milli, that pepper, that onion. I don't know. I never braai those things. You just eat it with the bright place. <laughs> Smells, it, it does something to us. I use Vaseline for men, cooling. And when I put it on my body, it goes into my skin and I, and I smell it and I feel it. I, I, Vaseline is the cream of the people, okay? That's why I use it. Proverbs 27 says, you should feel that way when you see your friend. Is that how you feel when you see your friend? Is that what your friends feel when they see you? That's what Proverbs says it's supposed to be like. And when you sit with your friend and you get counsel from your friend, being with you, so good, so good. That's what it means. It's great to be with you. It's great to hear from you. Thank you for your encouraging words. You know, the Apostle Paul, I mean, he's a hero of the faith, in 2 Corinthians 7, he writes, we were all over the place. In sixes and sevens. Things weren't going well with us, fam. And then Titus arrived. Oh, Titus. He was so encouraging to us. We so enjoyed having Titus here. He refreshed us. He revitalized us. He made all the difference. Wow. What a friend. Just imagine. You having those friends and you being that friend. That when you pitch, it's revitalizing and encouraging. 
counsel. Another uh, quality of a good friend is compassion. Compassion. Look at Proverbs 16, 28. A dishonest man spreads strife. And a whisperer separates close friends. You guys know that friendships can be damaged, right? Of course friendships are damaged. Why? Because of the sin of people. And that's when sin rears its ugly head. When you are dishonest, you spread strife. When you gossip, you separate close friends. So what do we do now? What do we do if that happens? Well, the answer is love. Look at Proverbs 17, 9. Whoever covers an offense seeks love. But he who repeats a matter separates close friends. In plain South African English, a friend doesn't keep on bringing it up. A friend doesn't keep on bringing it up. So don't do it. Forgive it. Let love cover over the offense. When you damage a friendship or when you are damaged in a friendship. Don't be dishonest. Don't gossip about it. Forgive it. Because when you do, then you seek love. Can I give a word to the couples in the house? How do you talk about your friends to each other? Marie and I talk about that often. If she keeps on spewing about our friends, she's influencing me. And if I keep on spewing about our friends, I'm influencing her. It's not a good thing. Because I'm going to cause strife, Proverbs 16. I'm going to cause separation. Because I'm actually gossiping with my wife. Or what if I keep on bringing up stuff that was hurtful for me in our friendships, and I keep on bringing it up with her? then I'm not seeking love because I'm not wanting to cover that offense with forgiveness. That can become really toxic, you know. And we have said to each other many times, we shouldn't do that. And when that rears its ugly head, we call stop. Because if I'm still hurt or in a posture of unforgiveness or bitterness, that's something I need to sort out on my knees. And that's something that I need to repent of It's not something that I bring up again. And then feeling this freedom in this really safe space to tell Marie what a knucklehead that person is. I'm sinning. I shouldn't do it. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. There you go. We're going to get back to love covering offenses in just a minute. If you have a bar that is too high for anyone to ever be able to achieve, you're not going to have friends. I just want to warn you, if you are a perfectionist who believes that everything should be perfect, including your friendships, you are going to be alone. Because your friendships can't be perfect and neither can you. I think we sometimes just set the bar too high. Oh, and we get offended so easily. Because the bar I set was, they should know everything of me, they should continuously call me, they should celebrate all my good stuff with me, they should uh, be with me in my poor days and my down days, and if they miss any of this, they are out. Well, you are very alone at the moment. Just scrolling through social media and being envious of everyone else's awesome times that they post. And that is the truth. Frederick Dostoevsky said the following, To love is to see a person as God intended him to be. Can you do that? Can you look at a person and love them when they are failing? Can you or can you not? Because if you can, you'll be a really good friend. Because that's how God sees them. All love for them, regardless of what they're going through and how they're failing. The late Archbishop Desmond Tutu said that granting forgiveness 
is synonym or is synonymous of is synonym to ish. It's the same as. Granting forgiveness is the same as recognizing shared humanity. That's what it is. I'm a human. I make mistakes. You are a human. You make mistakes. Therefore, I forgive you. That's it. That's how love covers over an offense. Look at what Peter says in 1 Peter 4. Look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13. Not robbing Peter to pay Paul. Anyone? Okay. Above all, thank you love. I really appreciate you laughing at my joke. I really do. Thank you. You are my best friend. <laughs> Above all, Peter says, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Paul again, love bears all things, believing all things, hopes all things, endures all things. That's compassion. So consistency, honesty, counsel, compassion, all of these things are qualities of a good friend. Last one, the qualities of a good neighbor. Uh, kindness, that's a phenomenal place to start. Look at Proverbs 22, 11. Those whose speech is gracious and heart is pure will have the king as a friend. Wow, sir. How do you speak to people? Are you kind? Because that will get you friendships, you know. Proverbs says that will even get you friendships with the king. Be kind. We read about characters like Barnabas in the New Testament. who was both in Jerusalem and in Antioch. And everywhere he went, everyone said, he is a son of encouragement. It's so good to have him around. Because he's always got this great, gracious, encouraging words. Barnabas went to Antioch. Rocked up at the church and went, Woo! There is a vibe in this place. I am so glad for you. You see? He was other-centered. Are you anxious? Well, then get a friend with a good word. Look at Proverbs 12, 25. Anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down. But a good word makes him glad. Oh, fam. If we could just have the courage to be obedient when the Spirit places someone on our hearts to give them a good word, it'll make all the difference. Because I know that you get it. I know it because I also get it. I think of someone and I just have something really encouraging to say to them. But then I don't make the time to do it. Oh, but I believe in my heart of hearts that they'll know that anyway. What if they were anxious? What if their anxiety was weighing them down? And that call or that message or that voice note, you can send a voicey for an encouraging word. Just want to say, don't do work over a voice note, but be nice over a voice note. You can do that. What if that person just needed that word? I see this in you and I appreciate this in you. Or I just want to encourage you today, you know. You might not see the end, but God does. Keep going. I'm praying for you. Just send the emoji at least. That's a good word. That's a good word. We, we'll explain that to Paul one day. We'll tell him that we started using pictures like the Egyptians and not using words anymore. Just be kind. Another quality of a good neighbor is just being sensitive. Look at Proverbs 27, 14. Whoever blesses his neighbor with a loud voice, <laughs> rising early in the morning, will be counted as a cursing. Uh, that's actually quite funny because I am a morning person. Do you guys know I get up in the morning? <laughs> that's how I roll. Grew up in a family of morning people. We were all like that. And then I married Marie. The first time we slept in the same bed was our wedding night, which is the way it's supposed to be. Great evening it was. So the next morning I get up first. <laughs> Marie gets out of bed. Not the same lady who I married last night, you know. She goes, <laughs> Don't ever do that again. Gets back in bed, covers head with a duvet. 
I'm reconsidering this whole thing. <laughs> I'm making a joke about it. But the point is, I wasn't being sensitive. I just wasn't. I mean, I was being awesome. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I, I just, I wasn't being sensitive. Think about others. Don't only think about yourself. Our garage, when I pull out the car in the morning, I can see our neighbor's bedroom window. So I don't go, come girls, it's time to go. I don't. Or, Adrian, how's it, buddy? Are you well this morning? Did you go for a run? I don't do it. Because our neighbor is not working at the moment. She can have a little lie in. I also don't go, rum, 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 rum. well, my Ronix doesn't do that, but it could. <laughs> you, you, you just think about your neighbor. Just be sensitive. Many of us live in clustered housing. It's the best place to be an awesome neighbor. It's also a real treat, you know. But anyhow. Like a madman who throws firebrand arrow, arrows and death is the man who deceives his neighbor and says, I'm only joking. Don't say to your neighbor, you know, I've got a bone to pick with you. Oh, really? No, no I'm just joking. Okay. It's kind of awkward. Your dog was really loud yesterday. Oh, really? Sorry. No, but it didn't bother us. Don't worry about it. I'm just joking. Almost fed it a Vienna with a little pill. In. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> Don't do it. Because you are playing catch and release with that person. And they'll, they'll never actually know. Well, where do I stand with you? Be sensitive to them. Obviously, there's a time and place for a good joke. I myself like one. But be wise and be sensitive. Let your foot be seldom in your neighbor's house, lest he have his full of you and hate you. <laughs> hey, listen, fam. You might think that you're really friendly, awesome, and that people love having conversations with you. And all of that might be the truth but in good measure. So if you just made a good friend, don't pitch every day. Don't pitch when it's bath time, for the kids at least. You know what I mean? Don't overstay your welcome. It's wise to be sensitive to the fact that other people also have lives. Let me be honest with you. I really love talking. I do. And I love chatting. That's why I always know all my neighbors and all about them. But when we do bump into a conversation and I have something that I want to ask, I say, I would like to ask you something. Is this a convenient time for a chat? I'm just being sensitive. Sometimes they say, yeah, I have time. Other times they say, I'm actually on my way to an appointment. Then I go, cool, man. We'll pick it up again later. Laters. It's just being sensitive. And I'm not, I'm not saying that I am a really good example of it. I'm just explaining how I am sensitive to others. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to do it. Do not say to your neighbor, go and come again. Tomorrow I will give it when you have it with you. Do not plan evil against your neighbor who dwells trustingly beside you. The point is, if you can bless your neighbor, do it. If you can bless them with an errand, do it. If you can bless them with a lift, do it. If you can bless them with material things, do it. And if you have it with you, do it now. Don't, don't let them wait. Whoever belittles his neighbor lacks sense, but a man of understanding remains silent. Oh, I'm going to come to your neighborhood now, and I'm going to talk about your neighborhood WhatsApp group. Who those are a treat, aren't they? The place where Christians throw away their testimony, just like that. Why? Because people belittle their neighbors on a WhatsApp group. How disrespectful. I can't believe people do this. Why didn't anyone tell me? I'm on a lot of groups. A Christian, someone with wisdom, remains silent. You just don't get into it. You don't spew with everyone else. That's not how we roll. You leave it. 
Let's look at Proverbs 14, 20. I'm almost done. The poor is disliked even by his neighbor or his friend, but the rich has many friends. Whoever despises his neighbor is a sinner, but blessed is he who is generous to the poor. I can't go into detail, but here's what you need to know. Loving a poor person asks a lot. It's just how it is. Loving a poor person is a high maintenance relationship. What this proverb says is if you are always the drama lama in your friendships, people are going to get tired of you. Because they get tired of the drama. Wears them out. It's a high maintenance relationship. Do you guys know why sensitivity is hard? Because of sin. Look at Proverbs 21.10. The soul of the wicked desires evil. That's all of us. His neighbor finds no mercy in his eyes. It's a real challenge for us, you know. Because we have many neighbors who really need mercy. So what now? How can this be fixed? The answer? Jesus. Do you guys know that Jesus had a nickname in the gospel? He did. A nickname always has something to do with you or your looks or your vibe. Jesus' nickname was a friend of sinners. Through that, that's what people called him. Sinners like you and I. Look at John 12, verse, um, oh, sorry, John 15, verses 12 to 15. This is my great commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. Family is good news, and that is in Jesus we have the ultimate friend. Just let that sink in. The value of friendships we spoke about, the quality of a good friend, the quality of a good neighbor, all of that is embodied in Jesus. We see it when we study his life through the Gospels, and we experience it as we are in relationship with him today. Jesus embodied exactly what this text says. And through becoming a human, living the perfect life, dying uh, as a substitute for us, and then being raised from the dead to open up eternal life for all of us, we can now become his friend. How cool is that? Do you need a friend? Jesus is available for you, you know. We say at this church, it's as easy as ABC. You admit your sins, you believe in Jesus, and then you confess him as your Lord and Savior. That is how you become a friend with Jesus. And think of the points we made and the friendships we described. That is exactly who Jesus is. That is exactly how Jesus rolls. And then Jesus sends us out to go and do exactly the same. So we become his friend. And then he sends us out to become other people's friends. And fam, let me tell you, this area that we are in are full of people, is, is full of people who need friends. I love this area. A lot of people coming in, a lot of people going out. A lot of people coming here for the first time to the city to try and make a living. A lot of people coming alone, you know, sharing a couch first and then a bed and then having a roommate. Hustling. Do you know what those people need? They need friends. They do. And we are called to be their friends. So may we truly be a fellowship city. Isn't that beautiful? That the word fellowship is in our name. This city can become a fellowship city. This church can be a fellowship city. May we truly become a fellowship city. Amen. I want to offer three responses to you and then I'm going to pray. Uh, the first really good response I think is Jesus, can we be friends? If you have not submitted your life to Jesus, you have the opportunity to do so now. You admit your sins, you believe that he died as a substitute for your sin, and then you confess him as your Lord and Savior. And then your friends, you can walk out of here today with the 
ultimate friend. I really want you to consider it. I think that's the first good response. Jesus, can we be friends? Secondly, fam, if you have been listening to me for the last 55 minutes and there's nothing that you can repent of, then you are indeed, as Christ is, the ultimate friend. I really think you need to repent. And if you feel like the Spirit is stirring repentance, then repent. Turn. There's no shame in repentance, you know. We all sin and fall short of God's glory. And then a third response, if it's not hardcore repentance, I think is, Jesus, please make me this kind of friend. Jesus, please give me these kind of friends. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you, that, thank you that we can be friends. Thank you that you are the ultimate friend. Thank you that you made a way for us to enter into that friendship. I want to pray, if there's someone in this place now, Lord Jesus, that says, can we be friends? That you would meet them with your mercy and your grace as they admit their sins, believe in you and confess you as Lord and Savior. They will exit this place reach beyond words and thank you that you did all of that for us and that it's by grace and through faith that we get access to it lord jesus we also fall short badly and we damage relationships and we speak evil words and we're not sensitive and we are self-centered and we are in friendships for what we gain out of it we are fair weather friends sometimes. Sometimes we keep people at a distance. We lie. We're not transparent. We're not vulnerable. Thank you that your kindness leads us to repentance. And that we know that we can start again. So when we repent today, Lord Jesus, I pray that we wouldn't feel burdened by guilt and shame. But that we would rather feel liberated by your grace and your love and your mercy. And the fact that we get another chance again. And then I want to pray, Lord Jesus, that you make us really good friends with each other. That you help us to become friends like you. And for those of us who are really lonely, longing and desiring for friendships, by your mercy, please connect us to one another in a way that we can get those friendships. I pray all of that in your name. Amen.